I welcome you to the first lecture of the spring 2017 season of the African American Experience in Missouri series. We're thrilled and honored to have Dr. Clarence Lang as our special guest. Uh, allow me to begin by recognizing and thanking the many people who make this series possible to Interim President Michael Middleton and Dr. Julie Middleton, who are both here tonight, thank you. Interim Chancellor Dr. Hank Foley, Dr. Kevin McDonald, Interim Vice Chancellor for Inclusion, Diversity and Equity, Nora Azizan Gardner of the division, for Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity, who's with us here too. I just saw Dr. McDonald, welcome. Mary Ellen Lohman, Strategic Communications Manager at the State Historical Society of Missouri. University Events Specialist, Ashley Schwab. Melissa Wilkinson of the State Historical Society. Eric Doyle Wright of MU Diversity. Susan Cameron of the Academic Support Center. And all of the staff members of the State Historical Society and the Division for Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity. Thank you all for your continued support and enthusiasm for this project. A collaboration of the State Historical Society of Missouri and the University of Missouri's Division of Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity, the African American Experience in Missouri Lecture Series is designed to offer the community opportunities to reach a new understanding of present day Missouri by learning about the history of black Americans in the state. Our series features some of the very best scholars in the nation taken together, their groundbreaking research has firmly established the importance of Missouri history to national histories of African American life and culture and the history of race and racial discrimination in, in the United States. We have had the good fortune of hearing from Dr. Diane Muti Burke from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, Dr. Martha S. Jones from the University of Michigan, Dr. Walter Johnson from Harvard University, Dr. Lee Vanderveld from the University of Iowa, Dr. Brian Jack from Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville, and Dr. Miller Boyd III from the University of Mississippi. And even with that long list, we are just getting started. Um, next month, this series will continue with a talk by Dr. Shawande Mustakim, who is Assistant Professor of African and African American Studies at Washington University in St. Louis. She will speak on the role of race and gender in a late 19th century murder case to explore laws and institutions designed to police working class African Americans. The event will be held in Stotler Lounge of the University of Missouri's Memorial Student Union. Save the date of April 4th for the continuation of the spring series through a lecture by Dr. James W. Endersby, Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Missouri. He will speak on the story of Lloyd Gaines, an instrumental figure in the eventual integration of the University of Missouri in 1950. Tonight, we welcome Dr. Clarence Lang, who is Dean's Professor of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Kansas, and Chair of the Department of African and African American Studies. He earned his BA in Journalism from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and his MA in History from Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville. In 2004, he earned his PhD in history from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He is the author of two books, Grassroots at the Gateway, Class Politics and Black Freedom Struggle in St. Louis, 1936 to 1975, and Black America in the Shadow of the 60s, Notes on the Civil Rights Movement, Neoliberalism and Politics. In addition, Professor Lang is co-editor of two books, Anti-Communism and the African American Freedom Movement, Another Side of the Story with Robbie Lieberman, and Reframing Randolph, Labor, Black Freedom, and the Legacies of A. Philip Randolph with Andrew Kirsten. His work also has appeared in such venues as Journal of Amer African American History, Journal of Social History, Journal of Urban History, The Black Scholar, Race and Society, Journal of Civil and Human Rights, New Politics, the Chronicle of Higher Education, American Studies Journal, Labor Online, and Critical Sociology. He is a distinguished lecturer of the Organization of American Hist Historians, as well as a member of both the Association for the Study of African American Life and History and the Labor and Working Class History Association. To my mind, Dr. Clarence Lang's work on Missouri history is groundbreaking 
because it defines in precise and illuminating ways that which makes the history of black freedom struggle in St. Louis worthy of critical examination. Dr. Lang's work on the history of the border south and the ways that space and place profoundly shape conditions for movement building, his identification of St. Louis as an incubator for working class inflected black freedom struggle, and his theoretical contributions to the ways that we understand the temporal, geographical, and conceptual dimensions of and distinctions between the civil rights movement and the movement for black power firmly established his status as one of the most important scholars of African American history today. Let's welcome Dr. Lang to the podium. I can live up to that introduction. Thank you. Can you hear me? All right. Well, good evening. <clears throat> I should begin with a few thank yous of my own. Uh, I want to thank the uh, State Historical Society of Missouri and the University of Missouri Center for uh, Missouri Studies uh, for bringing me to speak this evening. More specifically, I, I want to thank Gary Kramer and Keona Irvin for extending the invitation to be part of this lecture series, which I'm proud to be, to be part of. Uh, I am indebted to Dr. Kramer for his pioneering scholarship on African Americans in Missouri, which along with the work of Antonio Holland and the great late Lorenzo Green, helped to shape my own work as a graduate student. And I have to say I'm, I'm proud of, of Dr. Irvin, uh, who I've known since she was a, a graduate student and who is now an emerging scholar with her own amazing forthcoming book which you all must read when it comes out, um, and who I embrace as a colleague in a profession. And thank you to Mary Ellen Lohman, who assisted me with the logistics and arrangements that have allowed me to be here. Um, while I'm at it, uh, I also want to acknowledge a few other people in the audience. Dr. Ted Kodeshek, uh, who I got to know through a former instructor and mentor of mine. Is Wilma King here? No? Anyhow. Um, leading scholarly voice in the field of African American history, Dr. Stephanie Shonikan, uh, who is my counterpart in Black Studies here at, at MU, um, Drs. Michael and Judy Middleton, uh, and of course, I thank all of you for being here tonight. Um, the title of my talk this evening is Black History and Black Lives Since Ferguson, Contemporary Meanings of the 1960s Freedom Struggle in St. Louis, Missouri. Though I want to acknowledge that this paper um, as often occurs, has morphed in ways that honor these themes, but also depart from them. So bear with me. <clears throat> I want to discuss three things this evening. Uh, one, I want to discuss my work on black social movements in St. Louis, Missouri during the 20th century. Second, the current landscape of black protest. And third, what it means, or at least what I'll argue um, it means at this moment to be a scholar of black activism and or a black scholar activist. Um, in the process though, I also wanna give you a sense of how my time at MU uh, in the early to mid 1990s um, helped to shape my approach to these themes. I think the best place to start is to say a bit about how I came to write a book about black community, class, and social movements in St. Louis in the first place. Um, as Dr. Irvin mentioned, I was an undergraduate at Mizzou in the early to mid 90s. I earned my degree here in journalism with a minor in black studies. Um, I was a reporter for the Man Eater and later a columnist. Um, I don't vouch for all of those columns today. Um, I, I think in some ways I was, I, was, I was fearless in a way that I don't know that I am anymore. Um, I really admire that person I was at 22. Um, I had my first substantive experiences as an activist at this university. In April 1992, I participated in a massive march on this campus following the acquittal of four Los Angeles police officers in the beating of Rodney King. As it happened, the late African American historian John Hope Franklin was here for a series of lectures. And while the details are blurry now, you live long enough and things start to mush, I distinctly remember students most of whom had just marched, packing a room to hear him speak. And for me, as a journalism student, it was one of those moments where I was conflicted about whether my role in that situation was to cover it or was there another role for me to play. Um, and that moment around 
um, the response to, to that acquittal um, in 92 was, a, was, was one of the formative moments that I had here. Later, in 1994 and 1995, I was part of a small, loose coalition of black, brown, Asian American, Native American, and white female students who fought, among other things, for a new black culture center and earmarked, earmarked funding for multicultural public programming. Um, this put, put us into open conflict, not only with the Missouri Student Association, but also with the chancellor at the time, Charles Kiesler, um, and I believe uh, the individual who was his vice chancellor for student affairs, Charles Schroeder. Um, we were part of, um, we staged two marches, one of them to um, the rental center. Do you remember this? Do you? Okay. Um, I don't think I gave you too much trouble, but I mean, <laughs> but, um, but you might remember, remember that moment. Um, in the short term, at least, we lost that fight. And I honestly have some conflicted memories about that period. Um, at the same time, I'm deeply grateful for the encounters I had here because that moment of activism altered the course of my life. Uh, by the time I graduated, I had decided that I didn't want to pursue a career in journalism, but I did not have a clear sense of an alternative. And largely on a whim, at the invitation of the departing director of black studies here, I ended up pursuing an MA in history um, at Southern Illinois University at, at Edwardsville, which was located in the St. Louis metropolitan region. During my time there, I became actively involved with a grassroots community group the Organization for Black Struggle, which was chaired at that time by Jamal, Jamala Rogers, a founding member of that organization and a columnist for the St. Louis American and someone who became um, one of my mentors as I transitioned from uh, being a student to thinking about what it was to be, to live a life of, of, of the mind, but also to be politically and socially engaged. Um, this was a group that had been formed in 1980 by veterans of the Black Power Movement of the late 1960s and early 1970s. And by the time I joined this organization around 1996, it had a well-known reputation for the work that its members did around the issue of police violence in St. Louis black community, particularly on the city's north side. Through my involvement in this group, I became interested in knowing more about the longer context of local black activism in which I was engaged. And not only that, but the veteran activists with whom I worked in St. Louis persistently but caringly challenged me to do scholarship that would contribute to the communities of struggle in which I was then immersed. Consequently, black social movement politics in St. Louis became the focus of my MA thesis. And then, as my involvement in this group continued, the focus of my PhD dissertation, dissertation which of course provided the raw material for my book. Um, over the course of the um, I guess at this point, you know, 15 or so years that I lived with this project from thesis to dissertation and then to book, Grassroots at the Gateway, I came to fully appreciate how St. Louis and black people's history in that city matter to more than just my own general curiosity as a budding historian. That is to say, initially my scholarly interests were, uh, grew out of the convenience of living in the area. Um, but as I continued my studies, I began to understand how actually St. Louis wasn't just a convenient backdrop, but actually it mattered to the story. Um, as the project matured over time, I was able to frame the black social movements in St. Louis as a microcosm of larger historical dynamics. Here's the argument that I ended up making. Between the 1930s to the late 1960s and early 1970s, I argued, working class African Americans occupy the center of local black freedom struggles for fair and full employment, expanded social wages in the form of healthcare and education, a racially democratic labor movement, meaningful electoral participation and representation, and equitable urban development policies. And this is where my colleague uh, Kiona's work makes a difference because how she's building on the work that I did and frankly critiquing it, which is a good thing, right, in terms of the work that we do, is really sort of talking about how we understand black working class women's very central role um, in that work, uh, phenomenal work that she's doing. These battles generated both cooperation and conflict between black working class and middle class activists. I argue though that working class constituencies largely defined and directed the movement's political and economic agendas during this period. That is to say that even though these movements drew black people across class lines, 
the guiding nucleus of these movements during this period were laboring working class people. I contended, however, and that's from Detroit, it's not St. Louis, but you know, I'm taking some license here, so work with me. Um, I contended that as a result of automation, industrial decline, the resulting collapse in urban tax bases, and the government-sponsored repression of the movement's most progressive and radical forces, the strength of this black working class inflected or centered politics declined in the 1970s. The political vacuum instead was filled by a burgeoning post-1960s black middle class that was rooted in the professions, business enterprise, and most vis visibly electoral politics. And let me pause to say that's Bill Clay. I'm not saying Bill Clay is a bad person. He did very important work, a founding member of the Black Congressional Caucus. Uh, but I'm saying that, that he represented a particular kind of trend of the movement that came to the fore um, in, in a noticeable kind of a way by the 1970s and certainly by, by the 1980s. And that, in some ways, became the dominant, the dominant trend. So part of what I sought to do in my book um, was to better comprehend the simultaneous emergence of a post-civil rights black middle class, of which I was a beneficiary, all right, and the expansion of a so-called black underclass witnessed by individuals like myself who came of age in the late 1980s and into the 1990s. Now let me say more about this term, the underclass, and especially the dirty work um, that this concept has been used to accomplish politically. Entering contemporary political popular usage in the 1970s, the underclass became, according to political scientist Adolf Reed, quote, the central representation of poverty in American society, employed primarily to describe those existing at the lowest rungs of the socioeconomic ladder, the term has functioned more as an ideological device than as a real sociological category. Like other social developments in the 1970s that I mentioned, economically and politically, it further disappeared black working class people as political actors by shifting attention from structural inequalities of race and class toward a focus on the cultural pathology of the black working poor. And I, I wanna sort of make a, a point to say that, that that process was certainly racialized, but it was also deeply gendered. So to the extent that the underclass as a racial category became the chief representation of, 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 of poverty, um, the represent, that representation um, became commonly the black welfare mother, right? Um, and so here you have a concept that in its most potent form used race, used class, used gender, and because it was fixated on, um, on sexuality and reproduction, right, used that as a way of arguing against the concept or the necessity, the legitimacy of social welfare reforms across the board, right? Because as the argument went, the underclass existed because of its members' criminal deviance, dysfunction, and dependence on government programs. Accordingly, these were not problems social welfare expenditures could remedy, right? The argument was that, in fact, such exp expenditures only reinforce the indolence, the dysfunction, the pathology of the underclass. Where I'm heading with this, is that the discourse of the underclass made possible a turn that we're in the midst of, I think, today, a turn from social welfare to punishment, um, what some scholars have referred to as the punitive turn in US social policy. This has had um, particularly devastating, stigmatizing consequences for working class communities of color, the same working class communities of color that propel the major black social movements of the 20th century. And I want to put a finer point of this to say that it's not simply that the shift in, from, from social welfare to punishment had a disproportionate effect on working class communities of color, but that, um, but that those individuals were used as a symbol for arguing against social welfare um, itself. One quick example. Uh, if we think about uh, the conversation around Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, um, which may not be around um, for much longer, we'll see. Um, you will remember Glenn Beck, um, his argument was that it was simply a stealth program of reparations to, to black people. Um, or if we think about, um, uh, if, we, if we think about public expenditures, um, 
as um, independent taxpaying individuals being taxed to support right, lazy, poor people of color. Right? So it's not simply that, that, that black working class communities were disproportionately affected, but that they were also used discursively to leverage that shift in ways that have hurt working and middle class people across the board. Right? So I want to be clear about how race is, is, not, is not just simply um, the way in which people have been targeted, but how it's been used, how it's been employed. Okay? Um, a good example of this has been the war on drugs, out of which has come harsh mandatory minimums for drug offenses, specifically crack cocaine associated with the black working class poor, racial profiling, attacks on Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable searches and seizures, the militarization of local police in black working class community spaces, the mass incarceration of what, at this point, 2.3 million people, many of them for nonviolent drug offenses, a disproportionate number of them people of color, and pervasive assumptions of black criminality. One quick aside, um, and I do want to make sure that I don't get lost in the finer details, but my argument is that you cannot understand um, what happened in Sanford, Florida, um, that is the shooting death of Trayvon Martin, if we don't understand it against a backdrop of a broader criminalization of black communities, bodies, and culture, what have you. Right? This occurred in a gated community. This did not occur in the so-called ghetto. Right? This, this was a middle class kid who had been in trouble, to my knowledge, everything I've read had not been in trouble with the law, what have you. But yet, um, the work of this term, the underclass, how that's had an impact on social policy, how that's contributed to a broader racialized criminalization, I think is part of the story of that particular drama. Needless to say, given my research interest, given my connections to black activists in St. Louis, given my own background as someone who had found an identity on this campus, beginning on this campus, as an activist in the context of student struggle, I followed with close interest, as I suspect many of you as well did, the long chain of events that began in Ferguson, Missouri, following the shooting death of 18-year-old Michael Brown by police officer Darren Wilson in August 2014. Like many others who were glued to their screens, laptops, and smartphones, I watched the horrifying spectacle of police with riot gear and military vehicles occupying the streets of Ferguson after residents stridently responded to Brown's death. Then in April 2015, civil unrest erupted in Baltimore, Maryland in response to the death of another black male, this time 25-year-old Freddie Gray, following a police arrest. All of these activities and more some of them organized, others of them occurring more spontaneously, have since cohered under the general signature banner discourse of Black Lives Matter. Now, how does this connect with the historical writing that I've done about St. Louis? Uh, first, we have to understand the Brown shooting and the local and county police response to the vigils, marches, and protests within a social context shaped by the punitive term, that term again, the punitive term in US social policy, mass incarceration, racial profiling in Ferguson, the state of Missouri and nationally, the criminalization of black working class community residents and spaces, and assumptions of black cultural deviance. Second, we should understand events in Ferguson within the context of a long history of racial apartheid and economic disparity in the St. Louis metropolitan area. I deal with this in, in the book. Historically, St. Louis has been um, a pioneer in residential segregation. Um, when you say pioneer, that might suggest something to be proud of. It's not, but, but you know, St. Louis was a pioneer. In 1916, and other scholars have done this work as well, residents there were the first in the nation to pass a housing ordinance, segregation ordinance, through initiative petition and direct vote. A Supreme Court ruling voided the ordinance, but in the 1920s, St. Louisans were among the first to craft restrictive housing covenants, and by the 1940s, zoning laws to maintain racial segregation. The fact that Ferguson is, was 70% black, with a quarter of its population living below poverty, is a continuation of that history, I would argue. At the same time, Ferguson is typical, and I'm going to talk about this more in a moment, is typical of a more recent pattern um, that we're seeing in other cities, certainly in Chicago, where I was born and raised in which racialized poverty and spatial isolation has migrated from the nation's inner cities to the inner ring suburbs. 
right? Ferguson is, is emblematic of that. That is, as inner cities um, in many places have become sites for economic reinvestment, poorer populations have been displaced to older suburbs. And while white populations and commerce are living, um, um, are leaving these communities, the levers of city governance remain or had remained predominantly white, which has contributed to racial polarization that we saw in Ferguson and places like it. Third, we should understand the events in Ferguson within the context of an equally long history of political fragmentation in that urban region. The boundaries of St. Louis were locked in 1876, which prevented the city from annexing unincorporated areas that sprouted around it. The result is that St. Louis today has 90 municipalities surrounding it, all of them struggling to attract and maintain revenue streams. As a consequence, Ferguson's government relied heavily on traffic stops and court fine collections for 20% of his operating budget, or about 2.5 million. And I suspect many of you read the Department of Justice report about the Ferguson Police Department, very damning indictment. Um, but there's a lot of good work being done by scholars like Walter Johnson, who you mentioned earlier, on just this point as well. Um, this, who, who actually complicates this in some ways that, that I won't get into right now. But the point is that um, the austerity and many of these entering suburbs that are taking in poorer populations lent itself to a continuing problem of racial profiling with African Americans disproportionately stopped, even though they have been no more likely to be in possession of contraband than their white counterparts. In Missouri, as elsewhere, there has been low intensity warfare, I would argue, occurring between black working class communities and the police for some time. Ferguson, like LA in 1992, that captured my imagination, uh, just exposed it in a dr dramatic way to a national and international viewing audience. Viewing audience. Fourth, while Ferguson, and I, I use, I've started using Ferguson as kind of a metonym, right? I mean, if we understand it as a set of conditions rather than simply a place, Ferguson could have happened anywhere. Um, but I want to suggest that it's not a fluke that it occurred there. Um, a key piece of my argument in Grassroots at the Gateway is that as part of the border south, a region encompass, uh, 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 that encompasses Maryland, Kentucky, Tennessee, Delaware, and with some qualification, West Virginia, Missouri historically has incorporated regionally diverse modes of U.S. stratification. As scholars from E. Franklin Frazier to George C. Wright, Barbara Jean Fields, Peter Levy, and Tracy E. Keymeyer have maintained, the border south states were in an uncertain mixture of north and south, if you will, in terms of politics and culture, a region, according to the black sociology, sociologist Charles S. Johnson, where the nation's conflicting racial views and policies met and clashed. Not only have border south territories condensed the regionally diverse experiences of African Americans, but they often also prefigured, prefigured shifts in race relations for the rest of the nation. Um, if we think, for example, about um, how Missouri's entry into the Union in the 1820s marked the first major national debate about slavery. If we think about, um, I live in Lawrence, Kansas, so you can't walk across the street without people talking about bleeding Kansas. Um, that conflict that occurred at the Missouri-Kansas border which in the 1850s, which really presaged the Civil War in many respects. If we think about the Dred Scott Supreme Court ruling and how that further amplified the succession crisis in this nation, um, we can see that playing itself out historically over time. Missouri and other border south states were the for first former slave states to begin as well, dismantling legal racial apartheid in higher education. If we think, for example, of the 1938 Lloyd Gaines case that originated here on this campus, uh, the historic desegregation of St. Louis University in the early 1940s, the first such event in a former slave state. If we think about housing, um, I'm thinking of the landmark 1948 Shelley versus Kramer decision against racial covenants um, as being enforceable in a court of law. And employment discrimination, um, Green versus McDonnell Douglas in 1973, um, and how that helped to set certain, certain patterns. From this standpoint, I'm arguing, you know, this is why I take you through this, 
because uh, my suggestion is that from this standpoint, it may not be an accident of history that Ferguson and the St. Louis metropolitan region, followed closely by Baltimore, Maryland, okay, another border state locale, became ground zero for the wave of black community uprisings we have witnessed around this nation since 2014. Um, could that argument withstand in, intense questioning? I don't know. Um, but given the work that other scholars have done talking about the significance of this particular region, um, I, I think that argument at least bears some serious consideration. Um, like so many others around the nation affected by these developments, I involved myself in local community vigils, mass demonstrations, public forums, and even the 2014 Ferguson October mobilization in St. Louis. In the midst of this activity, I found myself thinking a great deal about what scholars do or ought to do when the focus of their scholarship comes home, so to speak. Um, to pose it as a question, what is a scholar's relationship with and responsibility to the subject of one's research? To put it yet another way, how does a scholar inhabit the subject about which she, he, or they write? especially if that subject concerns emancipatory struggles for social change. And here's what I mean by this. Um, when I was a, you know, a graduate student doing work on the, civil, the black freedom struggle in St. Louis, uh, Missouri, I often encountered people who, when I told them what I was working on, they would say, that sounds like an interesting topic. Um, why are you doing St. Louis? Right? And I actually had that issue when I was trying to, to get a contract for my book. You will have an easier time. You've had an easier time, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> Respect to elders, right? You know what I mean? So, um, people, could not, people were not interested in, in, in discussing why St. Louis would matter to anything. Now, that changed a little bit, and I'm dating myself a little bit here, um, when the Rams came to St. Louis and when Nelly's first album came out, then, you know, <laughs> I got the question a little less because, you know, St. Louis became recognizable in any sense. Um, you know, um, but, but Ferguson kind of changed that dynamic. So, you know, the, this question of, of the scholar's relationship and responsibility to research is an academic question in some ways, but it's not an academic question. Um, so on the one hand, my university be began to promote me as something of an expert. Um, and, you know, and, it, and I cringed because at, at the campus of the University of Kansas, I became known as the Ferguson guy. You know, people were calling me the Ferguson guy. And I hadn't even been, a, you know. Um, and, and, and in, one self, I, in one sense, I felt gratified as a scholar to be able to discuss my work, especially with non-academic publics, um, given the fact that I spent so much of my early career sort of defending why St. Louis mattered. Um, so that question was being answered. On the other hand, um, I had strong res reservations about being put forward as a commentator from afar and how this lent itself to, frankly, personal careerism on my part. And I will also add an opportunity for my university to further brand itself, even though KU, like most public institutions of higher education, had not done very well by black people itself, um, to be frank. And I've said this on campus, so it's not like I'm talking about my institution from afar. Right? Um, this tension was resolved in the fall of 2015 when a sustained protest camp campaign at this university brought Missouri back to the center of attention as a national bellwether of race and resistance. I suspect that many of you here experienced the events of that fall, uh, so you don't need me to recite them to you. Uh, but I will put a finer point on this. Beyond registering concerns that were particular to black students um, and faculty and graduate employees across race, the revolt here at MU uh, was an extension, I would argue, of Ferguson and Black Lives Matter more broadly. Right? It, it, it represents a, a cumulative development. Similar to Ferguson too, developments here at, at, at Mizzou inspired a wave of protests that spread to 90 or more other university and college campuses across the nation, including uh, the institution where I currently am located, the University of Kansas, where multiracial student demonstrators launched their own protest campaign in November 2015. Consistent with the demands articulated by students elsewhere, they called for greater recruitment of and academic opportunity and success for students of color, better recruitment and retention of faculty and staff of color, increased attention to diversity in the content of university curriculum, uh, 
Um, at some universities, particularly the private ones, I mean, they were grappling with like the, the very concrete actual legacies of slavery <laughs> in terms of endowments and, and how that manifested itself in, in monuments on the campus. And the fostering of a safer and more supporter, supportive campus climate for all students through such measures as hiring culturally competent student services staff. For many of us in higher education, and this is the part where I'm deep into talking about what are the obligations of the scholar at, at this moment, um, which is an academic question, but not an academic question. Uh, but I say that for many of us in higher education at MU, KU, and elsewhere, the period since then has been an educative one, I would argue, clarifying that it's this juncture between the pretenses of the university, and I do use that term uh, purposefully, the pretenses of the university as, as an institution, as a bastion of liberal inclusion where difference is recognized and celebrated, and its reality as often a place of structural violence and exclusion. Um, I witnessed students at KU uh, moving from debates about when or whether to go to Ferguson, or at one point whether to go to come here, um, to turning to our own campus, all right, in Lawrence, and universities in general, and talking about how the university can be an important space to contest for racial justice. In this same crucible, faculty, staff, and lower level administrators had to decide whether we were going to respond to this challenge. And I include myself, I'm a department chair, which makes me a petty administrator, right? So there are, people, there are a lot of folks above me. Um, but, you know, but, but, you know, I, I have to, to, uh, to engage these, these issues in ways that are different than when, you know, I was a 20 something year old writing these, these, um, these, these columns in the man eater. And I hope nobody goes and digs them up, you know, because uh, some of them, you know, um, but, and I probably in saying that, I've ensured that somebody <laughs> will do that. So that's my fault. But those of us who were faculty, who were staff, who were level, lower level and upper level administrators had to decide whether we were going to respond to this challenge by either, for some folks, heading for cover, some people did that, um, applauding ourselves simply for acknowledging the many inequities on campus and patting ourselves on the back for having had um, courageous conversations, difficult dialogues, um, or other university sanctioned activities with alliterative titles, right? Um, <laughs> or actually engage the moment in meaningful ways that would require the professional risks that would come from openly criticizing our chancellor, our provost, our deans, and colleagues. Further, all of us in one form or another had to grapple with the question of whether institutions of higher education can truly even be vehicles for opportunity, mobility, citizenship, and progressive change overall. There's a very good um, essay by a scholar named Robin Kelly called Black Study, Black Struggle. And one of the questions that he takes up in that essay is, um, can universities be spaces um, that are free from, from structural violence? Right? He accepts the argument that they can be diversified Right? Um, but can, can they actually be the, the spaces that we, we claim universities are or can be? Um, for me personally, um, this is good timing because I'm wrapping up. The past few years, um, and this is why I sort of put myself in a story a little bit more than I normally would have, because I have a history of this campus and, and a very complicated one, at least in my mind. You know, the past few years have brought me full circle back to my own political awakening here at M Mizzou and my coming of age as a scholar activist, where I would like to call myself as such, in St. Louis. Um, that is, this moment of danger and rebellion has opened a space to, for example, revisit the role of black studies as a discipline, as well as to consider the ways in which um, I can connect my campus engagement with larger community issues. Um, I think, for example, about the stark indicators of racial inequality in the Lawrence public system, a school system where I have a child. I'm a parent now, right, of a 12-year-old. The absence of people of color on the school board and in municipal and county government. Racial profiling by police and other patterns of discrimination in the local infrastructure of criminal justice. The work conditions and pay of fast food workers in the Kansas City metropolitan area and around the nation. Um, and the continuing work of making Black Lives Matter, uh, where I reside as a scholar, an educator, a black man, a son, a spouse, a parent, a concerned taxpayer, 
a citizen, and a human being. And that ongoing journey, again, began here at MU, and, and for that, I'm grateful and, and grateful for, for your time. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. We have time, uh, good time, for um, questions and answers. I'm happy to bring the mic to you. You're welcome to come to the front to take this mic. But are there any questions? While she's saying that, I'm, I'm an educator, so I'm compulsive about this. So just for, you know, for further reading, right? You know, you may or may not buy the book. You know, it's academic publishing. We don't get paid for that anyway. Um, but, you know, just for those of you, just in terms of some of the things that reflect my thinking and some of what you've heard today, there's a reading list, you know, so. <laughs> we need it for, for recording purposes, so, yes. This is my student, y'all. Hi. Um, am I supposed to say my name and stuff? Oh, hi, everyone. My name is Lauren Smith. I'm a senior at Mizzou, um, studying psychology and sociology pre-law with the minor in black studies. Um, so my question is, um, you kind of didn't really touch on like the anything that you found surprising during your research or something that you didn't know. What is something when you started the grassroots at the gateway, something that you were just like, whoa, this is stunning. I mean, obviously everyone knows about the war on drugs and the, yeah. you know, the, um, or the welfare queen, but something that just stood out to you about St. Louis that you were just like, huh, why, is this, why hasn't this been a part of the narrative from the beginning, yeah. and why would I want to uncover it now and yeah. let it be known to everybody? Okay, else? thank you for, thank you for that question. I mean, the talk admittedly was a, was a hodgepodge. I was doing a, working out some things. I'm going through some things right now, you know. It's been happening since November. Um, you know, trying to recalibrate, trying to figure some things out, you know. Yeah, yeah, so... Um, so one of the things that struck me about St. Louis um, was just how in, in many periods from the 30s up into the 70s that so many national organizations had remarkably vigorous local chapters in St. Louis. So for example, um, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, um, an organization formed by A. Philip Randolph, which was a labor organization, but also a very militant civil rights organization. One of his strongest chapters was in, was in St. Louis, Missouri. And if you think about where St. Louis is located as its hub, it's not surprising that, that at least there was a great deal of contestation um, and, and, and it was a very vigor, vigorous uh, uh, branch. The NAACP for a period had a very, very uh, strong branch in St. Louis. Um, and it had a very close relationship with the Teamsters Union. Now we think of the Teamsters nationally, and we think of Jimmy Hoffa. Um, but in St. Louis, because the Teamsters was so very decentralized, as long as you didn't get in the way of Hoffa's money, he kind of let the folks do locally what they wanted to do. And there was a gentleman by the name of Harold Gibbons, who was the head of the Teamsters Union there, um, who was a, a, who was a, a committed, um, working class activist, trade unionist, and anti-racist. And um, the gentleman who was the president of the local NAACP, a man by the name of Ernest Calloway, who deserves his own book, by the way, um, was the president of that branch. And he did some very remarkable things. So there you have a really clear example of how um, black people's labor and civil rights activism were really merged in some very powerful ways. And that's just one of several organizations that had uh, the March on Washington unit um, of the 1940s. Um, there's a good book by a scholar named David Lukander. One of the strongest chapters, one of the most militant chapters in the nation during that period. And they were the ones who kept going to A. Philip Randolph and saying, stop talking about the plans to march. Let's go ahead and do this thing. You know? um, so that was, that was something that surprised me. But also, just how significant that region was um, in terms of, and I don't want to speak too much longer to make sure we get some more questions in, um, the dynamics of, of St. Louis being a place where so many dynamics converged and how that had an impact on black politics. So you had protests, you had electoral activism, um, very, very complicated kind of, kind of, kind of politics um, that I tried to do some justice to in the book. I hope that's a, sufficient enough 
answer to the question. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask a question about the things you're going through since November. Um, <laughs> given that we're probably not going to see uh, any more Justice Department reports like the one on Ferguson for a long time, um, I'm wondering how you think that needs or, or, or what kind of shift in protest strategies that suggests now that the federal government as an ally is kind of off the table for a while. Um, that's, that's the question right now, right? I mean, and, and, and I guess I would say that in some ways we might to speak from the work that I've done, we might be going, have to go back to a period um, before, um, before that high tide of resistance in the 1960s, where it became a lot about what people were doing at the local and at the state levels. Um, so in the state of Kansas, uh, for example, um, one good thing, maybe you wouldn't consider it good, but there were moderate Republicans who were brought into office. Um, if you know about the political climate, in Kansas, that was a good thing, um, right? Um, even if you're you know, a Democrat, you, would, you wouldn't vote Republican. And so for my own self, I've sort of thought about, OK, well, where are the spaces that I occupy? And that has to be the place where you begin to do some things. Because if we think about it, the moment that we're in now, a lot of that was incubated at the states. And at a certain point, it became, it didn't matter who was in the White House. I mean, we saw this through most of the eight years of the Obama presidency, because once the states became the ground that was, that was captured, that's where, that's where the bench of, of a number of these folks who have run for office have come, from as, as, have come from the states. So it seems to me that it's the state level, but it's also the finer grain community level. I can't think of any other way than, than to, you know, to, to start, start digging where you stand. Or at least that's, that's the answer that gets me up in the morning these days. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you. For um, coming. I would like for you to talk a little bit more about that space that you inhabited um, as an activist sure. and the space that you inhabited as an academic scholar. And what did that feel like? How were you switching back and forth yeah. and drawing from that? Mm -hmm. um, and I would like for you to talk a little bit about uh, that being, active, being an activist and how you felt about policing. How I felt about police. Okay, you got a lot of questions happening there. So, um, it's going to keep you from looking at the manual. Okay, that's all right. Yeah. Uh, okay, so so this question of of sort of what is it what does it mean to be committed to a kind of a scholar activist life um, as a department chair, right? Um, I mean, you know, that's right. Um, so. So part of, of, of what I've learned is, is that there's, there's institutional work that has to be done. That's not sexy, that's not exciting, um, but are, are sort of critical, critical kinds of things. So there are issues of curriculum um, that you have to, well, I mean, because it's student credit hours, right? I mean, that's, you know, you, know, you live or die, die by that. But also trying to get students to think about the multiple ways that activism can take. I had a really interesting moment in November of 2015 um, where the students um, occupied um, the chancellor's and the provost suite. And uh, it was just a really interesting moment because I scrolled back and I was there at one point in those kind of, those kind of activities. But also sort of thinking about the fact that there are some things that students can do that perhaps faculty ought not to do. Um, that there's advice that, that, that you give. Um, there's, there's comfort that you give, but then it's also getting into some people's ears. Um, here's a, a better way of answering it. Um, in the context of being the chair of, of a black studies department, I was asked to, to, to be a co-chair of a diversity, equity, and inclusion advisory group, right? And we were charged with, with doing a report. And I knew I was in trouble um, when I saw my face and name in a newspaper and there wasn't even a committee yet, right? So I knew that this was about pacifying. Um, and so at a certain point, I was lucky. We had a group of folks, and we essentially went rogue. And so we actually wrote a report that contextualized how the university had gotten to the, the moment that it was. Because the danger, of course, in that kind of DEI work 
is that it becomes happy talk, right? Um, and, it's not, and it's not critical. And so the acting provost at the time made a very big mistake, um, or at least she learned it was a mistake, um, is that she allowed us to function kind of on our own outside of the purview of the provost's office. And needless to say, she wasn't very happy um, with the report, which told me that we had done a good job. I mean, I, I don't mean to sound cynical or anything like that, but, you know. Um, so it's that, it's that kind of work. It's not necessarily the protesting at this stage, necessarily on, in the context of the campus, but it's about being in spaces to raise the issues, to validate the students, to remind people that the reason why we're having these conversations that have not occurred on this campus, I'm talking about KU, literally since 1970, do you hear me? Literally since 1970, is because those students sort of did what they, what they did, and so we owe them a debt for that, even if, um, and I've recognized I've become, um, I don't know if the word is, is conservative, but the thing that I always kept wincing at, these students curse a lot, and you know what I mean? I try to get as many of them as I could to say, you know what, you don't have to do that, you know what I mean? So, and you know, and sort of, sort of really feeling kind of as a fogey, and you know, and, and because I curse in some of those man-eater columns that, you know what I mean, you might look up. But um, there, there's a lot that's kind of happening in, in your question. I don't know that I've done justice to it. Um, but in some ways, is recognizing that the role that you play at one phase in your life is not necessarily that the, role, the role that you play at another. Um, but I've become a lot more engaged, a lot more interested in affairs off campus. Because what happened is that there was rebellion on the campus. It spread off campus. And it's sort of, so what you have is this kind of uh, insurgency that's created spaces everywhere in Lawrence from the campus to the community to raise issues and to do things that th the space didn't exist before. Um, and so you find ways to make nuisance, a, a nuisance of yourself, I think. But it's not the same way as maybe students might do. And certainly staff have certain kinds of limitations and there are things they ought not to do. So there were other questions and I'll, I'll try and keep my, subsequent responses and probably need to go back over on that side too. Yeah. Hi, this is kind of a specific question, yeah. but uh, in your book you mentioned the 1969 rent strike and I was wondering if you ran across any other instances of uh, working class activism and public housing in St. Louis. In St. Louis, okay, so you need to read this scholar's work, her book when it comes out, right, because she's talking about that um, as well. Um, Kiona Joseph Hecoff was doing a book on this. Has that book come out yet? Okay, there's a scholar by the name of Joseph Hecoff, who, H-E-A-T-H-C-O-T-T, uh, -T -T, who's been threatening a book um, on public housing and the politics of resistance in public housing for a few years. Um, um, he's done some good work on that. Uh, in my own case, I was most influenced by a really good book by uh, Rhonda Y. Williams talking about black women in public housing in Baltimore, Maryland. The title of that eludes me right now. The politics of public housing. Politics of public housing, right? Um, I don't know if that answer, answers the, the question. There's not a whole lot. I mean, there's some good archival material. I didn't make as use, good use of it as I could or should have. Um, but I would say what you need to do when Dr. Irvin's book comes out, you need to, because you, you do justice to that, don't you? Okay, all right, a little bit? Okay, all right, all right. So there's, st there's still plenty of work. To Are you a graduate student? Yes, I'm stopped working on that. Ah, okay, all right, okay, okay. So that's, that's gonna be your dissertation then, right? Somebody needs to do that work, so, yeah. Some good documents at Southern Illinois University, uh, Edwardsville, um, the Lovejoy Library, some really good papers on the, on the rent strike. Um, yeah, I think it's the um, 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 Harold Gibbons papers, I think there, yeah. Hello. Um, as a slight like student activist here on this campus, um, and I did a little groundwork in like Fall 15, um, I kind of struggle with like documenting um, what actually happened. Um, so understanding that movements are made and sustained by like more common people, um, I would. My question would be, um, what role would you say that scholarship plays in like the general freedom struggle? What role that scholarship plays? Scholarship specifically plays in like freedom struggle. So I, I think that when it's done conscientiously, it becomes a space to, to draw lessons, um, to kind of see what worked or may not have worked um, in the past, um, to talk about questions of theory and, and practice. Certainly, um, the, the Grassroots at the Gateway book is deeply inflected 
um, by some of the, the experiences that I had in St. Louis because there's certain kinds of scholarly questions you don't even think to ask if you've not had even minimal kinds of political engagement. So the question of what are the internal dynamics in an organization, right? You have to have sort of been in some of that sticky stuff to even know to ask, to ask a question like that. Um, but the place that I, so, so I would say that it's, it's, it's essential, um, I think. And it's a way that I think that scholarship is meaningful beyond just telling interesting stories. And it's a way in which activism um, is linked closely with, with intellectual work. Um, because one of my, I would say humbly, and this may not apply here, but certainly some of the experiences that I've had, um, one of the, the things that I've noticed among younger activists, and I'm dating myself and I'm gonna sound foggy, is um, you know, study groups, I think are really, really, really important, I think particularly at, the, at this moment, that I think there can be a kind of action orientation that leaves behind the fact that that study is not just simply pontificating, but it's about how you draw lessons, how you engage in criticism and self-criticism. And I think scholarship can play a part in that process. But let me add to this as well, because I've, I've, I've said this to the student activists at KU. Um, one of the best pieces of advice that I got when I was here and, and my colleagues who were involved is like, you need to like archive your stuff. Um, yeah, you shake your head, but I mean, that stuff is Im important because, um, because some of the abuses that students have had are really abstract until you've documented what happened. And I think from the standpoint of subsequent scholars being able to come back and document what occurred, that's a really important point. Um, I was part of a loose coalition, the Coalition of Concerned Citizens. We had a couple of names, right? Um, our papers are in the university archives. Um, and I think that all folks who are, who are politically engaged, you have to carve out, humbly present it, carve out some time to do that. And in fact, because of social media, I mean, that can be done electronically in ways that are easier today. But I think that that's, that's not a sidebar. That's essential, I would argue, to, to, to activist work, even though everyone is, is busy trying to do so many things with so little time. We have time for one really okay. quick question. And you know, maybe really we could response. do this. If, if yeah. maybe there were a couple of hands, if sure. they all ask them, okay. and that will that will make it easier for me to avoid answering them because I'll mush them together. So. so, does that sound like a plan? Does that work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, being here this evening. I'm a sociologist, master's degree from Lincoln University, and I had the great occasion. It's been many years ago to speak with Dr. E. V. Hill a black pastor in the inner city where the Rodney King riots took place. Mm -hmm. And he made the observation, I'll share it with you and welcome your, your observation and, and critique or comment, that um, many of the young men who were engaged in the rioting really suffered from the lack of having a father in their home. Would you care to comment on Dr. Hill's uh, observations? Okay. All right, so that's one. I'm gonna come to that, so I'm just jotting them down. Yeah. Um, my name is Justin Kohler. I'm from Muskegon, Michigan, and I, I thought it interesting how you said St. Louis had like an, a history of pioneering and like the redlining of cities. My city has that like very much so as well. So it's really not like a matter of like a, like a central southern state or northern state. It can be anywhere. But in your opinion, how do like we move on and like break through those barriers of having like the black neighborhood or the white neighborhood, things like that? These are some stompers here. Hi, my name is Carol Brown. I'm one of the common people here in Columbia. Um, <laughs> I'm curious how you see community activism playing out in Lawrence to deal with community policing, with uh, racial profiling and policing, and with the school district. You have a 12-year-old, your kid's in school. What do you see there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Last night. Um, I'm interested in uh, shifts that you've seen in Ferguson since the unrest, especially in voter registration, voter turnout. Uh, how was it in November? Has there been a significant shift in the makeup of the city council yeah. and the police department? Um, any word of hope or is there still discouragement about uh, community uh, taking care of itself. 
Okay, so let me, let me answer these, these backwards. Your question is, is the easiest to, to answer. To be perfectly honest, I've fallen behind in sort of my keeping up with, with affairs in Ferguson. I know that there was, there was an election. Uh, someone was, someone of, of color was elected onto, uh, I think, the city council. Um, I don't know where things stand, and I would not want to be in a situation of, of speculating and speaking um, without knowing. Uh, because one of the curious things is, strangely enough, um, and you will see this happen when your book has been out, you get to a point where you're trying to put your old work behind and move forward, but like in, you know, Michael Corleone, they, they draw, you, draw you back in. So um, there's some more reading that I need to do about what's happening in, in, in that region that I've not done as of late around Ferguson. So a lot of what I've, I've shared with you, um, at this point, I mean, I think things have pr are probably more dynamic and maybe there are others who, who know better than, than I do. So I'm sorry that I can't give you a fuller answer than that, but I, I wouldn't want to be irresponsible to, to speculate. Um, in terms of community activism in Lawrence, um, Lawrence is a really interesting place um, in the sense that it's very culturally liberal and it looks and, and functions and, and different than, than perhaps other parts of, of the state. Um, but as, as I tell people, the second you talk about inequality, people are, are talking about John Brown is, you know, abolitionism and, you know, what have you. And sometimes it's like, I wish I did live in a former slave state because no one has that argument and you can actually get down to, to brass tacks. But having said that, um, there's actually, there, there are actually some, uh, uh, some vigorous activity that's developing. And to the other gentleman's question, which is why I'm sort of saying this idea of working locally, I think has become, for me, very, very important. So there, there's a group called Justice Matters that's doing work around um, police profiling that's fighting back against an effort to expand the jail um, rather than provide uh, greater mental health services. In fact, the argument is that, well, we'll expand the jail, we'll give mental health services, but it has to be affixed to an expansion of, of, of the jail. Um, there's a very vigorous, a lot of activity happening around the inequities that have come to the surface um, um, in the school district. Um, so, so things are opening up um, in some promising ways. There's going to be struggle, uh, but, um, but, but it, you know, at least when there's a fight, there's a possibility to win something. And so I've been encouraged by folks who I've encountered who are well into their 50s in some cases, um, not that there's anything wrong with that, who have not been politically active in their lives before and are taking their first steps. Um, and to me, that's, that's a very hopeful sign right now. I take my victories where I can get them, because they're few and far in between. This issue of housing segregation, um, I'm afraid I don't have much for you um, on that, to be perfectly honest, except that, you know, sort of the, you know, sort of observing the irony that it was easier to get um, a black family into the White House than it's been to, to, to meaningful, meaningfully desegregate neighborhoods. I don't, Frankly, I don't know um, where we begin um, with that issue. I just, I just simply, I simply don't. Um, I think that we have to, you know, we have to talk about affordable housing because I think that these things are are linked. And in Lawrence and in other areas, there's a serious crisis of that occurring. And so I think that that may be a starting point. Um, to the gentleman's question regarding fatherhood. Um, I'll be perfectly, perfectly frank with you. Um, I think what, what all children need are loving, caring individuals in their household. Um, and whether that, you know, as in my case, I was raised by a single, a single mom, or if there's two parents, um, if there are two moms or two dads, or if they're extended families, um, I, I think the question is how do we give families, however they look, the resources that they need to be autonomous and to provide for children. And the makeup, in my mind, you know, is for me becomes secondarily. I go back to Trayvon Martin. I mean, because the question is, where are the fathers? He was living with his father in a gated community because he had been in trouble and his mom said, well, you go live with your father. Um, and so to me, in some ways, that complicates the, the issue of whether the problem is that simply we just need to, you know, to have males in the household. And I think one of the remarkable things about Black Lives Matter, and I will say for my own self, um, and I know we have to wrap up, but when I, was, when I was here, if you could talk about race and class, I mean, you were cutting edge. If you could talk about race and class and gender, 
then you were like advanced. And now um, I'm having to do catch up because I'm finding that students are far more agile and they're talking about sexuality. And I think one of the sort of the amazing things that's occurred is we think about the framing of issues. You cannot, I think, be credible um, in this kind of work if you're not mindful of all of these intersecting and simultaneous um, identities and how we frame the issues, who leads, who follows, um, and what the agenda should be. And so um, I will say that I've, I've been happy to learn a lot from the students who have, have, have walked further than I have on, on some of these questions. Um, so um, this has been an educative moment for me as well. And one of the things that I learned at Mizzou um, is to, you know, and I credit this to the journalism school, is, is the idea of being inquisitive, being a perpetual student, being a lifelong learner. And I think that that has to carry over into how we think about how we make um, social change. And that's probably, uh, probably it. So thank, thank you, you all. Thank you so much. For, for Thanks for coming. Thank you, Professor Lang, for a wonderful lecture, beautiful discussion. We have um, a book signing to follow immediately. You can finish your conversation. Make my press rich because I won't get anything. So. <laughs>